Thanks, Lord Jesus, for this spectacular reminder of your goodness to all generations and to all nations. We love that picture that you've given us at the end of Revelation of the tree of life, which grows on both sides of the river. How you do that? One tree, both sides of the river. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. We love that. We love the healing that you're doing right now in Ghana. Thank you for the beautiful, powerful vision that you've placed within leaders in that place. We pray as they gather in your name that uh, just like we would long for here, that your name would be exalted, that you know, credit would go where credit belongs. And uh, we, we love that that's going on, and we're grateful for the peace that uh, we've been able to have uh, in, in individuals making that trek over and being part of that and supporting. We love it, we love it, we love it. Lord, over Maya, who has their own adventure and mission going on, um, leaving camp counseling and moving towards uh, Cape and Ray for a year, we ask your blessing again and um, your power into her life. Powerful, fantastic time, right? Coming out of high school, put, doing a gap year, and wanting to do this as a young person, listen to your voice. Be attentive to what you might be saying. Lots of life ahead. Want to make sure that um, the foundation is poured correctly. So fill her with your spirit. Open her ears and her eyes to hear and to see the things that you would have her take in. Thanks, uh, thanks for your kindness and goodness to all our young people. Um, we pray these things. Teach us now, Holy Spirit, we ask your name. Amen. Okay, it's good to have you guys in the house. Glenn Emery, it's good to have you here, brother. Uh, many of you, and those of you who are online, we, uh, we welcome you as well. We're this hybrid church now, and so, you know, you may not get to know Tim if you're online, and some people that are online, you won't like get to know Sarah, uh, not today anyway, but we're in this together in the name of Jesus, right? Emerson, you with me, brother? Emerson, you are with me. Thumbs up. All systems are go. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Going to fly. Not going to fly. We're going to be careful with the word of God. Here's Paul. He's talking, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment of me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us? as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard, doesn't eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and doesn't drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it's written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this about us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us. Because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered at the altar? In the same way the Lord, this is Jesus, in the same way the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. I have not used any of these rights. And I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. For I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this that in preaching the gospel I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free 
and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Okay, last section. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body, make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Here we go, baby. Have you ever had the experience where you've seen something advertised, maybe it was on television, maybe it was like online, whatever it was, and you're like, I need me that. And you went and you got that thing, and you come back and you got out of the box and you're like, hmm, clearly not as advertised. Yeah. Anybody remember a million years ago when we were studying the Sermon on the Mount? Right? The Sermon on the Mount was this picture of how Christians are going to be like. We're going to deal with our anger and we're going to honestly tackle our lust. And we're going to figure out a way not to, not to judge people. And, and we're going to live into this kingdom and we're going to do it all and fantastic and love our enemies. And, and then like, poof, what happened? And and it kind of feels like the church in Corinth might have gone through this. They heard all of this stuff, and it was going to be like this, this new life that they were going to have in Jesus, and then Corinth just seemed to screw up at every turn. And Paul doesn't lose heart. Paul's like, yeah, yeah, okay, we're still working this out. Jesus is still true and right and good, and we are going to work this out. And in this particular passage, Paul is trying to remind the Corinthian believers about what's most important in life. And he starts by talking about rights. Rights. Paul says, listen, as a church leader, I have certain rights. I have the right as a church leader to ask of you food and lodging. I have the right to have a wife. I actually have the right to have my wife come and for you to have to put her into the same house and feed her as well. We, we church leaders have a right. You He had a right to make money in this preaching gig, paychecks, the whole thing. And he makes this point. Many pastors do this. I actually do this. I get paid. I don't know if you know that, but I get paid. Many pastors do this, and it's a good and reasonable and a right thing to to do. And he goes on to say, listen, soldiers get paid, and and farmers get to eat a part of their crops, and and shepherds drink lamb's milk. Is, Is that a thing? Lamb's milk? Ew. Uh, And grape growers get to eat their grapes, all those sorts of things. They have a right to do these things because uh, they're doing that work. And so they get to access the stuff that's right at their fingertips. Preachers get paid. Paul has a right to get paid. And he doesn't claim the right. Verse 14, if you're following along. The Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights. Paul's trying to make a point here. It's actually not about him. He's trying to talk to the Christians in Corinth this truth. Christians don't always have to stand up for their rights. Hmm, interesting. This is what Lanita was preaching last week. If you were here, we got the recorded message. Last chapter, there was a bunch of confusion around eating meat. And could you eat the meat? Because maybe the meat was offered to an idol at one point. And would it be okay? And Paul's like, absolutely. You got the right. You can do that. Go right to it. Unless, by doing so, you might actually offend or get in the way of the good news about Jesus. In which case, you would give up your right. I don't need my rights. Because this person over here is more important than my rights. 
This is the point that Paul's making. He's not like super, super clear about why he wasn't accessing those things that were rightfully his, why it was that Paul decided not to get paid, not to get food from these folks. I suspect it had to do with the fact that Paul was a pioneer. Do you know what I mean? He's like an icebreaker, the groundbreaker. He's the first in. He's telling people about Jesus. Hey, here's a story about Jesus, God who loves you, laid his life down for you. You can be forgiven. You can find full life. There's actually a promise of eternity. That's what's available to you in Jesus. And then what happens? People believed. Well, they walked away from all this pagan thinking, all this selfish living. They believed in Jesus. Then what happened next? Paul shoves out his hand and says, pay up. Right? You see what's happening here? Paul didn't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I want to look like like a snake oil salesman. Not at all. So it looks like he made a decision early on, I'm going to support my own self. But I'm good with pastors being paid. Because I'm a pioneer, I'm going to go on my own. He set up churches who would have pastors, who would get paid, but he would make and repair tents. That was Paul's gig. So let's just, let's just, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's just do this. Rights are good things. Rights are good things. Back in Paul's day, the only way that you had serious good rights was if you were a Roman citizen. That means if you were born into the right family, lucky you. You had rights. And if you were born into a non-Roman family, mm, sorry about your bad luck. That was the way rights worked back in Paul's day. In our day, we talk a lot about human rights, and they are good things. Much of what our culture And our society understands as human rights, they get from the Bible. The fact that human beings have rights comes directly from the Bible, directly from the conviction that each of us is made in the image of God and therefore of incredible worth. It's the Bible that says that a woman's life is equally valued to a man's life. It's the Bible that says this. It's the Bible that says that a slave's life is equally valued to a wealthy person's life. It's the Bible that says that a foreigner's life is equally valuable to a national's life. Do you know what I'm saying? Human life is precious because the Bible says so. And our Western culture has has borrowed this from the Bible. That's the story that they have learned from us. Yes, human rights. They're good things. It can be right? It can be that people only want to ever talk about their rights. It can be that people feel threatened at every turn because somehow they are going to have something taken from them and they're on high alert. And human beings can get fixated on their rights. Not Paul. Not Christians. We're aware of our rights. Being a Christian doesn't mean you have to let people toss you around like like a rag doll. That's not what Paul's saying here. It's just that we're fixated on a bigger story than this one. We're fixated, Christians are fixated on the gospel, on the story of the good news of Jesus. That's what we're all focused in. Did you hear what Paul, you hear what Paul said? We didn't use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. We're fixated on the story of a God who laid down his rights for us. We're fixated on the story of a God who laid down his life so that the world and its people could be rescued from its slavery. That's our story. That's what we're hanging on to. Doesn't mean that there isn't a time in a Christian's life sometimes to take part in a march, take part in a protest, to advocate for those who need to be heard, rights of the unborn, 100%, rights of black people, you bet, indigenous people, for sure, for the persecuted, for all people. It doesn't mean we don't speak up. No, we can. We should. We do. All of those things, though, all of those matters are put through this primary filter of this. What is it that people understand about the Jesus I love by the way I'm behaving? You hear that? You get that? Yeah. It's good to stand up for these things. It's good to defend those who are defenseless, but it's super important that we do this in a way that points people to Jesus, right? And and has them falling in love with him like we're in love with him. For sure, stick up for the disadvantaged, and maybe sometimes you'll even stick up for what's rightfully yours. Paul, though, is less inclined to make this a major piece of his life. 
What he is inclined to do is, here this, watch this, this is really something else, to make himself a slave to everyone. Isn't that something? To make himself to, sl- to a slave to everyone to, a- to win as many as possible. That's Paul's script. It's a powerful image, right? Because like we're running around talking about our rights, and Paul is making himself a slave. The very reason that we're all worked up about demanding our rights is because we don't want to be a slave. Do you know what I mean? We don't want to have anybody in control of us. We don't want anybody using us. And Paul is looking for ways to serve, right? So that he can be part of this great human rescue that Jesus is still doing. It's this powerful, upside-down world, upside-down kingdom. You know, sometimes... Sometimes when people get all about their rights, they're pretty unhappy. And sometimes people get all about their rights, they're not just unhappy, they're just flat out angry. It's not, it's not attractive. It's particularly not attractive when it's Christians. It can make for unhappy, angry people. Paul had been, in his life, an unhappy, angry person, but not anymore. Not anymore. He got a sniff of this upside-down kingdom. In fact, let's be honest, what happens is he met the upside-down king right side up. He met the upside-down king, and his angry life was wrecked. He couldn't go back to being an angry, demanding person that he used to be because he'd been hijacked by love. That's what happened to Paul. And now he was doing whatever it took to have the good news of Jesus make sense to all the people around him. I have become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. What's going on here? Well, he talked about Jewish concerns with Jewish people. He could talk about Roman culture and governance with with the Romans. He learned how to chat philosophy with the philosophers. He moved to the other side of town, and he, as it were, lived in a trailer park kind of thing. He left behind the pursuit of his own rights for the greater thing, which was to pursue relationships. I'm going to leave my rights behind so I can lock in on relationships. I just want to point this out. It's not really in the passage, but but it's here anyway. He he didn't go neutral. Do you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't just that he wasn't angry anymore, but he also wasn't apathetic, right? He, He wasn't just staying to himself, wait for the action to come his way. Jesus had put a charge into him, a charge. I think I got this right, Mike. Right? In firefighting, we talk about charging a hose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're on the fire grounds, and trucks pull up, and the hoses come off, and they attach them in, and then they're like lying limp on the ground, and then all of a sudden, boom, baby. <laughs> and then, then somebody, right? Right. Red line's charged. Yellow line is charged. This is exactly it. There's this charge. <laughs> we're ready for the action, ready to get pointed at the flames. Jesus had put a charge into Paul. And if you're a Christian... Christian, Emma, right? Jesus has done the exact same thing to you. He's put a charge into you, right? And this thing has to come out of you. He's put his life into you, and his life is going to come out of it. You're full, and you need to be pointed at the flames and released into this, right? What does that mean? It means you're actively looking for ways to connect people to Jesus. That's you. That's what's going on here. That's what Paul is. What does that mean? It means if the neighbor kid plays hockey, then you go to some of her games or some of his games. It means that if your neighbor is a Muslim, then you go next door and listen really well. It means that if a colleague of yours asks you out for coffee, you say yes. And maybe even you invite your colleague out for coffee. To talk about Jesus, first thing? No, no, no. But, but when that comes around, you're ready for that. I have become all things to all people, so that all possible means I might save some, and I do this for the sake of the gospel. We are not neutral. I'm going to wait for it to come to me. No, it's not us, right? We don't wait for the action to come to us. Not at all. We move in like a runner who runs, like a boxer who boxes, like a firefighter who fights fire. We move. We do. We spend ourselves. Okay. This might be a little opportunistic, so fasten your seatbelts. Right? We, the church, actually the church, not just this church, but the church in this area, uh, maybe in uh, North America, is struggling. Right? We've been through a pandemic. And many things about our life together got put on hold, got pressed pause. 
Uh, we move deeper into praying together. We work more intentionally at discipling each other than we ever have. And uh, we kept teaching God's word. So not everything went to pause, not everything went to hold, but some things did. So things like serving coffee, things like counting offering, things like caring for kids in the nursery and in kids' zone, and youth work, we lost much of our energy. And this fall, we're trying to get on our feet again. And there's a bunch of new opportunities that are right here in this church. Online has opened up another world. We need online hosts, people to connect. We have a funeral team here. We've got tech team. Here's, okay, opportunistic. You go to the church website, www.stpauls.ca, S-A-I-N-T-P-A-U-L-S, stpauls.ca, on the home page, and then you find the thing that says get involved, and then there's like serve. There's something that I could do. We need some charged hoses who are willing to get pointed at the fire and, and to go for it. We need to rise into what Christians have always been designed to do and to be, which is to serve and be servants. The pandemic meant that we served each other differently. Many of you did. I know you did. But some of us just kind of like put the whole serving business to the other side, and it's time. It's time to get back to serving each other. Our kids need to know about Jesus. Young parents need to be able to come to church and put their kids in a program, and they need some kid-free time to be invested in by the church, and we want to be that kind of church. I know. I know it's easier to move towards your own comfort. I'm right there with you in that temptation. I get it, right? But listen to see if the Spirit of Jesus isn't prompting something in you to serve. Listen. Colleen and I were just talking the last couple of weeks, and we feel this compulsion. We wonder if it's the Holy Spirit to work with, do the youth ministry this year, right? To get into it with high school students and to run with that. We we looking at it like it's a small group. We think maybe you can become small groups for high school students. We've got to figure it out. Bronte, Natalia, Mark, Emily. We've got to figure out which night of the week is going to work best. Colleen's even hinting at summer or Sunday morning brunch once a month or something like that. She's nuts. But we, we got to figure out what, what night's going to work, and let's do this, right? We're going to, along with the rest of the church, we're going to grow in our faith. And we're going to need a, some, uh, some young adults to work with us. I was thinking at 56, this might, right? Dave, this might be a younger man's sport. Now, Paul doesn't think like that, and I know Jesus didn't think like that either. Teens, you're going to lead. We're not going to be out there pablum feeding you. Right? We'll equip you, but you're going to lead. We're going to do this together. All right, there's other ways, right? Others of you will rise into something else. Please ask the Lord Jesus where your charged hose is going to get pointed. Don't make any knee-jerk decisions. You know, we're not like chicken with our head cut off kinds of uh, uh, living lives impulsively like that. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, right? You're charged, and you need to serve. Did I say this part? Homepage, get involved. Yep, serve. Okay, okay, good stuff. So here, he, Paul talks about rights, and then he talks about the even more important thing of relationships. And, and then the third point really isn't more important, but it's equally important with this, and it's about running with purpose, running with purpose. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize, run in such a way as to get the prize? What's he talking about here? Paul's smart enough to know that life has temptations. Paul's smart enough to know that there is an enemy who works against a life of service to Jesus, the great distractor. And so Paul is saying right here, right now, stay alert to those things that would pull you away from where you belong. Stay alert. Athens hosted the Olympics. Corinth hosted the Isthmian Games every two years. Corinth knew all about world-class athletes, right? You don't become, a, Craig, Mustard, back me up here. You don't become a world-class runner, right, by crushing Big Macs. Do you, Craig? Maybe you do. Right, you don't, you don't win the prize by parking your backside on the couch. You don't, you got to train. You don't win the prize by staying up late at night and sleeping through your alarm. No, you set an alarm and you actually get up and you put your sneakers on and you get out and pound the pavement. Same thing for Christians. You're in training. You're saved by grace. You live by grace. I'm not saying you can earn something from God, but you are called to train. 
You were called to train, and you got a job to do, and you got a prize that waits for you. Jesus promised. Sunday morning, August 21st. Here's the question. Are you, are you really ready to do this? Are you all in? Is it 100%? Because that's what, that's what Paul's going for here. Back in the day, they didn't com- compete like they do now in the Olympics for gold medals. That wasn't the, the prize. The prize was a wreath you could wear around town and be like, hey, check me out. Right? And it, it was made of olive branches-ish, I guess. But I was doing some reading this week and found out that some of the wreaths were actually made at times from celery. Celery? Celery. That stuff goes limp in a day and a half. Celery. Oh, check out my celery wreath. Right? Like, like, celery, are you serious? We have a crown. Jesus promised a crown, that a reward that lasts forever. Okay, I'm getting all serious. I've been on too long a vacation. Here's a happy thought I'm going to end with. Someday, like Paul, you'll be dead. Yeah, this is a happy thought. Yep, I got way too much time on my hands. Someday, you're going to look back on all of this. And this particular day, even, will play back to you in high def. Are you doing now the things that you'll want to watch then? I was talking to a friend this week who lives in the UK. And I asked this question. I said, so what's the, what's the football? What's the football culture? What's the soccer culture like in Manchester where she lives? She's like this. They're nuts. The fans are crazy on game day. It's like they're going to war. They got the paint on, and they're going through the city, going towards the stadium. It's like, and if things don't go well in the game, they rip their seat off in the stadium and throw it out there. She says, it's like a band of marauding barbarians after the game. You don't want to be in the streets. She talked about a university professor, big fan, whose job as a university professor prevented him from going to away games when Manchester United play in another city, not in Manchester. And so this university professor quit his job as a university professor and signed up to be a taxi driver. So he got flexible schedule so he could go to away games. And I thought to myself, that's celery. That's limp celery. Any chance that any of you have got yourself chasing celery recently? They do it for a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for rescuing us from lives that chase temporary, even pointless things. Thank you for inviting us into your mission to love and serve this world. Fill us with your spirit so that we can see the difference between those things worth pursuing and those things that aren't. Fill us with your spirit so that we can live and love among those who need you. Fill us with your spirit so that we run with purpose and don't chase after those things that could disqualify us. In Jesus' name. Okay, friends, find your, your feet if you can. Stand. I'd like to speak a word of blessing. How many more are you going to sing? Four or five? What? Who's in charge here? Here, here's God's heart. Here's God's hope for you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the friendship of the Holy Spirit is yours right now, the rest of the day and tomorrow and forever.